Some pretty cool news today from the intersection of AI and game development. One of my favorite topics ever, and a topic in which I think you will be interested in as well. Let's talk about a project from Microsoft that's really pushing the boundaries of how AI can support and enhance human creativity in gaming. We're beginning to see more and more AI in game development. Very recently, we saw that part of XAI, Elon Musk's company, they're beginning to develop an AI game development studio. So we're launching uh, an AI gaming studio. Under the XAI umbrella. Google DeepMind, of course, had many different publications with neural nets and video games as well. Game Engine, that allowed you to play Doom, that simulated Doom, but instead of running on code, it was running on a neural net. So it was basically able to play the game in real time. The neural nets would kind of like imagine what happens next. They would imagine what happens when you push the walk forward button, what happens when you push the shoot button, etc. We had similar things happening with Minecraft. Somebody got Minecraft to run on a neural nets. And today we have something in the same vein, but from Microsoft. This project is called World and Human Action Model, WAM. So the world and human action model, WAM, what does WAM do? Do they sing timeless classics like Last Christmas and Careless Whisper? No, thank God. WAM is used to generate gameplay ideas using AI. This is a generative AI model of a video game that can generate game visuals, controller actions, or both. Now, Microsoft also has a different nickname for WAM, which is good because you don't want to get confused with a uh, musical group. The nickname they have for Wham is Muse. Muse. Muse is actually, now that they think about it, is also a band. But whatever band they're naming it after, the point of it is that Microsoft had access to an incredible data set that was gathered from years of recorded gameplay, visuals, and controller actions, specifically from their game Bleeding Edge. This was thanks to the collaboration with Ninja Theory. And this data set was kind of a gold mine for them because it provided their AIs, the neural nets, with the ultimate tutorial on how to understand and predict gameplay. So again, they have uh, data on game visuals versus like the controller actions. They predict the model that's able to predict those game visuals, controller actions, or, or both at the same time. Some of you can probably guess where else this will be uh, applied. We'll get back to that in just a second, but using this treasure trove of data, they built a world model, a virtual representation of the game environment. So basically the visuals of the game that can forecast how events will unfold. So we've talked about this in Game Engine, you know, Google DeepMind's replication of Doom with neural nets. Basically with code, everything's kind of deterministic, right? So everything that happens on screen is coded by a human being, sort of scripted, right? So we know what happens when you push the control button in the old first person shooter games and in the old Doom games. Do you remember what the control button did back in the days? If you do, you're very old. We all use the left mouse button for that now. But the point is, instead of it being coded, we're teaching these neural nets to predict what's going to happen when you push those buttons. The AI is basically getting trained on all the game footage, absorbing every nuance of the game's rules and physics. That's basically what the AI is learning to do. And then it's able to replicate that kind of like imagine what would happen in real time as you're playing the game. So for example, one of the models, Wham! 1.6 billion parameters can generate complex gameplay sequences that are consistent over several minutes. All those sequences are generated by prompting the model with the first 10 initial frames. So basically one second of human gameplay and the controller actions of the whole play sequence. Muse is used in world model mode, meaning that it's used to predict how the game will evolve from the initial prompt sequence. And the, the more closely that generated gameplay sequence resembles the actual game, like what actually happened, the more accurately Muse has captured the dynamics of that game, the more accurately it can simulate what happens. Now, developing this sophisticated model was not an easy task. 
Scaling up the training to generate complex and diverse gameplay sequences posed some significant challenges. So as an example, here's an 11 second clip of actual human gameplay. So you can see the character moving in a 3D space, the various physics of the game, all the visuals, the background, the heads up display, like everything that happens on screen has to be simulated. Now, after 10,000 training updates, the generated gameplay is still rough around the edges. We're beginning to see some signs of life, but the quality deteriorates quickly. We're seeing characters becoming recognizable. We're seeing some basic movement and geometry. Now, after 100,000 training updates, the model is consistent over time, but does not yet capture the relatively less frequent aspects of the game's dynamics, such as, for example, the, the flying mechanic. So we're still able to recognize the characters. We still have basic movement and geometry. And now we're beginning to see that there's no degeneration over time. And then finally, after 1 million training updates, so kind of notice that kind of a logarithmic growth. So we have 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. But after 1 million, we're beginning to see consistency with the ground truth, right? With the original human gameplay, right? That flying mechanic is, is captured after 1 million training updates. We're seeing correct interactions with Power Cell and Muse is able to model the flying mechanic correctly. The other big part of this technology was getting it to help empower creators. Microsoft hosted a hackathon to develop what they call the WAM demonstrator. In the Microsoft blog post, they said this was done to explore a new interaction paradigm and creative uses that Muse could unlock. Do you remember that weird kids show from back in the day if you, where if you said the secret word of the day, like just everybody would go nuts and chaos would ensue. I feel like I'm going to start doing that on the channel. And if we ever read any post by large corporations, that word's going to be paradigm because you know, they're always going to use the word paradigm to describe something. But the point is that this WAM demonstrator, you know, the new interaction paradigm allows the users to load some visuals as an initial prompt for the model. In this example, a single promotional image for the game Bleeding Edge. And then they use Muse to generate multiple potential continuations from that starting point. Now, at this point, the user can kind of look at those generated sequences, so similar to Mid Journey or Dolly or anything else, where you have kind of multiple variations and you kind of can choose one and then continuously tweak it to improve it. Here, you can see the different generations, but also you can use a game controller to direct the character within any single particular generation. So, this kind of shows how. Muse can help you enable iteration as part of the creative process. And with WAM Demonstrator, Microsoft is trying to identify which capabilities that game creatives would require to use models like Muse. They focused in on three key capabilities. Consistency, which is the model's ability to generate gameplay sequences that respect the dynamics of the game. For example, the character moves consistently with the controller actions and does not walk through walls and generally reflects the physics of the underlying game. Diversity, of course, is the model's ability to generate a range of gameplay variants from the initial prompt, from the initial starting point, that covers a wide range of ways in which the gameplay could evolve. And persistency refers to a model's ability to incorporate the user modifications into the generated gameplay sequences, right? So if you kind of copy and paste some visual, some character skin, for example, that that persists throughout the entire generation. Now, under the hood, Muse is powered by a transformer-based model. So transformer was one of the big things that kicked off a lot of the kind of the AI stuff that we're seeing right now, created by Google in 20. 2017, that famous paper, Attention is All You Need, and it kind of kicked off this AI revolution because basically it allows to scale learning. Before that, for example, if the model was reading or generating a long piece of text, it would kind of forget what it was reading by the time that it got to the end of it because it would lose sort of like the context, all the different connections between words, right? So like if I right now, if I said the model forgot what it was talking about, you know, I'm not talking about like a photo model, like an attractive person modeling products. You know, I'm talking about the AI model. You know that because of all the other connections, all the words that I've said previously and the connections between them. Now at this point, it makes it so that you understand what model I'm talking about. 
Before the transformer architecture, the models would have problems because they would forget all those little connections between words, how they relate to each other. If the text got too long, the transformer architecture was scalable. It would be able to process more and more data. You just needed to throw more and more compute at it. So here, this is also based on a transformer based model. And as it's being trained on the extensive gameplay data, right, it essentially learns to read the game like a book to understand the flow of events and how actions lead to outcomes. Now, in terms of the application, like where does this technology come in? Of course, there are a lot of different applications, first and foremost in in-game development. You would be able to use Muse to rapidly prototype new levels, mechanics, even entire game concepts. For indie developers who may not have the resources of a large studio, this could be like having an entire team of AI designers at your disposal. Now, of course, the other big thing that Microsoft talked about is, I believe they were gonna call it Recall. There was quite a bit of a backlash, so I'm not sure exactly what's happening with that, if they're still going through with that. But the idea was to record all of your actions on your Windows so that you're able to go back and review them. That was the sort of the official explanation. According to the press release, the data is supposed to be stored locally on the machine. It's not shared with Microsoft or used to train their models. Now, of course, something like that would be incredible for training AI agents that are able to operate the computer, right? Similar to OpenAI's operator, using the ideas behind Muse and Wham and applying them to teaching the computer to sort of operate itself, to teaching an AI agent to operate the computer. That is where a lot of this is going, and it's likely that there will be some more attempts by Microsoft and others to try to capture that data. Now, of course, a lot of people are upset with stuff like this. They don't want their data to be used to train AI. There's tons of privacy questions. For me personally, I just care that these companies provide a clear explanation of when something's being recorded, when it's not, having an easy way to switch it off when I don't need to. Now, interestingly, with Muse, Microsoft recorded users playing the game Bleeding Edge, recorded the, the keystrokes and the resulting actions on screen. They were fortunate that they had access to that data. They're Microsoft, they have tons of games, Xbox, etc. Google DeepMind to do the game engine and do the same thing with Doom. They didn't have as much of that high quality labeled data. So they actually coded up a bunch of AI agents to sort of a stream playing Doom. And they created, I believe, a dozens of them all playing for just 24 hours a day, just creating visual footage of them playing the game Doom, while also using the keystrokes so that the game footage would have the keystrokes combined with the resulting gameplay footage. And they built those agents to learn how to play Doom with reinforcement learning. That was one of the craziest papers to read. Extremely interesting. But the point is, you're seeing this with recall, right? The need to record actions and results in order to be able to develop something that's able to, you know, navigate the computer, navigate the web. We're seeing with this Muse and Wham, or recording people playing the game in order to be able to create a model that's able to generate images of that game to predict how certain keystrokes get executed. With Game Engine and Doom, they got around that by creating a little AI agents that, that play the game, but that was an easier game that might not always be a solution, that might not always be a possibility. But what are the cases if Microsoft ever decides to rename their recall feature to kind of rebrand it? I would like to suggest a name if I could, since it's something that's going to be sort of responding to the user needs to navigate the computer. It's also based on the knowledge of how people use the computer. I would like to suggest that we call it Knowledge Oriented Responsive Navigator or Corn for short. I think it's simple and easy to remember. Let me know what you think, not just about corn, but also about Wham and Muse. What do you think about those technologies? And uh, what do you think about those bands? If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time. Slash salute.